Good morning. And welcome to worship here at Lakeside on this uh, beautiful day in September. Uh, we give God thanks uh, for the opportunity to gather here as brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, we come to worship an awesome God who has blessed us in, in so many ways. And we also know that in this life there are burdens that weigh us down. Uh, there are challenges. And yet uh, Christ is with us and meets us in the midst of those challenges. And we know that Christ is here today with us to refresh us, to renew us, so that we may leave this place with a joy in our heart, a bounce in our step, and ready to serve God in all that we do uh, in our communities and in the world in which we live. Uh, just a few announcements this morning. Uh, tomorrow at 11 o'clock is going to be the celebration of life for Dick Bailey um, here at Lakeside. Uh, that. Uh, there will be a time uh, to meet and greet, a visitation uh, before the funeral service at t from 10 to 11. Uh, the service will be at 11 and then following uh, there will be a lunch. And I believe that uh, tomorrow's lunch is actually going to be fried chicken mashed potatoes. <laughs> Dick always liked the party, so, uh, so there it is. Uh, so please, um, if you were able to uh, come, uh, Joyce was not able to be here this morning as she's not feeling well, so hopefully, yes, uh, keep Joyce in, in our prayers. Also, Saturday, the 18th, next Saturday, is going to be the ordination uh, for Scott uh, Burns, and so please, if you are able, uh, our Bishop Laurie will be here on that day, and it's, a, it's an exciting day at 2 o'clock. Uh, here at Lakeside, is Scott has been called uh, to uh, Ridgeland Lutheran in Ridgeland, Wisconsin as their pastor. And so it's going to be an exciting day of one of our own to be ordained. Sandy. And just, Mick? Just a reminder, this Wednesday and Thursday at 8 o'clock, uh, Yellow Lake Food Distribution in Webster at uh, 8 o'clock. That's the uh, connections across the lanes. Uh, many hands are always appreciated. Thank you. And one final announcement is our annual meeting is going to be October 3rd, and that will be uh, following our, our Sunday morning worship. And so... Uh, look forward to uh, all of you being able to attend our annual meeting. And at this time, uh, Julie, please prepare us with prayer.
Please let us stand as you are able. Let us continue with our confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who forgives all our sin, who is mercy endures forever. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your spirit so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. And by grace, you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit, that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. May be seated as we sing our gathering song. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
Let us pray. God of grace, you have given us minds to know you, hearts to love you, and voices to sing your praise. Fill us with your spirit that we may celebrate your glory and worship you in spirit and truth. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Together, let us pray our prayer of the day. O oh God, through suffering and rejection, you bring forth our salvation. And by the glory of the cross, you transform our lives. Grant that for the sake of the gospel, we may turn from the lure of evil, take up our cross, and follow your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. For the sharing of the peace this morning, and I know that uh, this is the opening day of the NFL, and I thought we could just be open-minded, and but uh, Packer fans, I'm getting a little tender in my older age. And so for all the Viking fans this morning, we're going to share the peace with, Ooh, is that how the horn goes? Who can do it better than me? Somebody give me the Viking. <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> Maybe we better just do the pass then. <laughs> the peace of the Lord be with you all. <laughs>
Good morning. <clears throat> Our first reading this morning is from Isaiah. The image of the servant of the Lord is one of the mo notable motifs in the book of Isaiah. Today's reading describes the mission of the servant whom early Christians associated with Jesus. Like Jesus, the servant does not strike back at his detractors, but trusts in the steadfast love of God. We read from Isaiah chapter 50, verses 4 through 9a. The Lord God has given me the tongue of a teacher that I may know how to sustain the weary with the word. Morning by morning he wakens, wakens my ear to listen as those who are taught. The Lord God has opened my ear, and it was not rebellious. I did not turn backward. I gave my back to those who struck me, and my cheeks to those who pulled out the beard. I did not hide my face from insult and spitting. The Lord God helps me, therefore I have not been disgraced. Therefore I have set my face like flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up together. Who are my adversaries? Let them confront me. It is the Lord God who helps me, who will declare me guilty. Our psalm today is Psalm 116. We'll read verses 1 through 9 responsibly. I love the Lord, who has heard my voice and listened to my supplication. The Lord has given me. The cords of death entangle me. The anguish of the grave came upon me. I came to fear and sorrow. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is full of compassion. Turn again to your rest, O my soul, for the Lord has dealt well with you. I will walk in the presence of the Lord in the land of the living. Our second reading this morning comes from James. This text uses various images to illustrate how damaging and hurtful the way we speak to and about others can be. Not only are we to control our speech, but what we say and how we say it are to reflect our faith. We read from James chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers and sisters, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For all of us make many mistakes. Anyone who makes no mistakes in speaking is perfect, able to keep the whole body in check with a bridle. If we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we guide their whole bodies. Or look at ships. Though they are so large that it takes strong winds to drive them, yet they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great exploits. How great a forest is set ablaze by a small fire, and the tongue is a fire. The tongue is placed among our members as a world of iniquity. It stains the whole body, sets on fire the cycle of nature, and is itself set on fire by hell. For every species of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed, and has been tamed by the human species. But no one can tame the tongue, a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless the Lord and Father, and with it we curse those who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth 
from the same opening both fresh and brackish water? Can a fig tree, my brothers and sisters, yield olives or a grapevine figs? No more can salt water yield fresh. This is the word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel from St. Mark, the 8th chapter, beginning with the 27th verse. Glory to you, O Lord. This story provides the turning point in Mark's Gospel. Peter is the first human being in the narrative to acknowledge Jesus is the Messiah. But he cannot accept that as the Messiah, Jesus will have to suffer. Moreover, Jesus issues a strong challenge to all by connecting discipleship and the cross. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked his disciples, who do the people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others, Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, You are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed. And after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples, and he said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The Gospel of the Lord. May be seated. I invite the children to come forward. Hi, Noel. Boy, you get bonus points today, huh, Charlie? Uh, Do you like the Packers? Well, you know what I have on here today? I have a, this is a pretty fancy cross, isn't it? And it was actually, it was at my ordination uh, many years ago, and I tried to find whoever left it there, and I never was able to find who left this cross. And so I just sort of finally one day said, it must have been a gift to me. But when I think about the cross, why why do we think about a cross? Hmm, in the church. What's so special about a cross? You know what? You know why? We always remember, because that's where, guess who died on the cross? Jesus. 
Yeah, I know. They nailed him to a cross. And so if we look around this morning, just look once. Let's go for a little, we'll go for a walk over here and look it up there. What do we have? A fish, yep. <laughs> and do you know before the symbol of, before the Christians had the cross, they, they had fish. Yeah, that's what, but there's also a cross up there, isn't it? Yep. And let's go, oh, look at, look at up here. Look at uh, way up. That's a big wooden cross, isn't it? Yep, and there's another cross on the other side. And there's a lamb, because sometimes we think of Jesus as a good shepherd. But what's above it? A cross. And there's all kinds, look at all the crosses down below there. I bet if we looked out throughout the church that we are going to find crosses everywhere. And the reason is, is because when we think of being a Christian, a follower of Jesus, we think of, yeah, we think of the cross. Yep, that he was on the cross, but the good news is, even though he died on the cross, guess what? He rose again. Three days later, God rose him from the grave so that he lives forever. So let's pray this morning. Good morning, Lord. Thank you for this day. Thank you for our lives. Help us to use them to serve you. May we pick up our cross and follow you wherever that leads. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And before you go this morning, Noel, I have something. One of our members, whose name was Roger Anderson, you know what, he, he made crosses. He made these beautiful crosses, little crosses. And you know what? I know that he would want you to have one. And since I'm guessing if you got home and you had one and your little sister didn't have one, she'd be sad, so take one for Emerson too, okay? All right. God bless you. Have a good day. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. We reach a transition in Mark's gospel. As once again we are uh, told of the story where Jesus is having a conversation with his, his group of twelve. And he begins to ask them, he said, you know, what's the, what's the word on the street? Uh, who do the people say that I am? Yeah, one, you know, says, well, you know, some say you're the return of Elijah the prophet, others John the Baptist to return. Some said uh, another prophet. And then he looks at them and he asks them this important question. Because he says to them, who do you say that I am? And it's at this point that Peter, you know, makes this uh, amazing confession. Because it's Peter who says, you are the Messiah, the Son of God. And it's at that point where Jesus said, you got it, Peter. And then tells them, however, don't say a word to it to anyone. Be quiet, right? Be quiet. And then he begins to go on and said, Oh, and by the way, I am the Messiah, the Son of God. And I have been sent into this world to be handed over to the elders. I will be persecuted. I will be condemned by the elders, the chief priests, the teachers. And I will be nailed to a cross 
and crucified and die. And three days later, I will rise again. And it's at that point that Peter takes him to the side of the road. You know, and he said, listen, it's not going to happen that way. Right? You are the Messiah. And the Messiah is not going to be handed over to our religious leaders where they're going to nail you to a cross. That's not the way this whole thing works. Because there was many traditions within first century uh, the Jewish thought on what was going to happen when the Messiah came. But for the most part, here's the story. That when the Messiah came, that he was going to condemn the wicked, that they would be judged and that they would be punished, that the righteous would be lifted up, and that the kingdom of Israel would be restored. That's how it was going to work. And everybody knew that. There was nowhere anywhere that the thought was, well, there's going to be the Messiah is going to suffer and be nailed to a cross. No way. And yet then, it's Jesus who then looks back to the rest of the disciples, really calls Peter out and said, get behind me, Satan. Ooh, ouch. And really telling Peter, look, you don't understand. You don't understand the plan. And the more I think of it, I can relate with Peter. Because it's sort of crazy, isn't it? It's sort of crazy that the Messiah, the Savior, is going to die on a cross. Do you realize that the cross was, it didn't get any worse than the cross. You know, it really didn't. Uh, one of the, he was the, oh, sort of the Roman philosopher Cicero. And he said this. He said that to be crucified was an instrument designed for its victims' utter degradation and excruciating torture. Capital punishment so vile that it appalled even tough-minded politicians. To bind a Roman citizen is a crime, and to flog him is an abomination. To slay him is virtually an act of murder. murder. But to crucify him? There's no fitting word that can possibly describe a deed so horrible. We think about the cross, right? And we think, how many of you are wearing a cross today? You can raise your hand high. It's good, you know, that's because it is, right? That we see crosses everywhere. In fact, they became, uh, you know, that the sometimes they're such a, a, a popular fashion statement that it's uh, Macy's. Macy's itself said that here you can now shop for a fifth size covered with gold hobnails. What's a hobnail? Anyway, or one with a cameo in the center surrounded by purple, green, blue, and pink semi-precious stones. And then with an extra long antique silver chain so it could be slung shoulder to hip. Bandolier style. Which, by the way, happens to look great with a crushed velvet cat suit and little hiker boots. <laughs> you get the picture? I'll tell you what, if the early Christian church, okay, we're talking the first century, second century, third century, all the way really up into the fourth century, if they would have seen all the crosses, they'd been horrified. Absolutely horrified. Because for them, I mean, crucifixion was the worst. And the Romans used it all the time. That they would line people up on the side of the road and there they would hang. There was, you know, you, you think about, 
and I don't know why, why would I ponder stuff like this, that if I had to be executed, which way would I want to go, All right? You know, guillotine's quick, you know, and sort of dramatic to go along with it. Uh, you know, you got the firing squad, electric chair, lethal injection, uh, burning at the stake, uh, I would, but I tell you what, probably is no, no more painful way to die than to be crucified. It was horrible. I mean, it was a horrible way to die. You would just basically, eventually, you would just, you couldn't hold yourself up anymore. You know, can you imagine that you've got this spike through both of your ankles? Okay, and how bad that pain must be. And yet you have to force up because if you don't, you begin to say you can't breathe. And so the excruciating pain. And then eventually you just can't do it anymore. And you suffocate. And you die. And to think about, that's our symbol? That we post everywhere is the cross? Can you see why Peter was saying, Jesus, it's not going to happen this way? It's not going to happen. And I tell you, the word Peter uses is also, I mean, <laughs> it, it's epitomeo. And you know what that word, that's the word Jesus used when he, when he told the storm to be still, quiet. When he told demons to come out, he used that verb, epitomeo. You be still. In other words, shut up. And you think about that conversation where... <laughs> Where Peter, where Peter says to Jesus, shut up, don't talk that way. And Jesus turned it back to Peter and go, no, you shut up. <laughs> but it was strong language. And understandably, why it was strong. Because the thought of the Messiah, the Son of God, dying on a cross, how, how can this be? And yet some 2,000 years later, it took place, didn't it? It took place. You know, it, it just even now, that sometimes the cross is just so painful when you really think of what it means. Because the early symbols uh, was the fish, right? The early Christians. If you've seen the ecthus, right? The fish, right? Another of the early symbols was, was the lamb. Uh, they also even had uh, the harp or the lyre. Uh, another one of their symbols was the ship. Uh, and a lot of churches are still made in the... They had all kinds of symbols for being a Christian. But guess what they didn't have? They didn't have the cross. But for us... For us, God's salvation was carried out in the most craziest of ways. That Jesus willingly came into this world and willingly went to the cross for us. And you talk about words that, that mean everything. I once had a t-shirt, and I really liked it. And uh, it just finally, you know, I can't believe it, I actually wore a t-shirt out. That's not easy. But it had all kinds of famous figures on it. And, it. and they were all mixed together in a sort of a mirage. Is that a mirage? Is that a w collage? Not mirage, a collage. You know, I'm a farm boy. And so, you know, it's, any word that has more than seven letters, it's a, it, it's a collage. And so you couldn't really, but you know, there was like Martin Luther King Jr. That, but, and I forget what the front said. It was something about all important people. But then when you walked past people and they looked at the back of your shirt, it was highlighted in red. And it was the picture of Jesus. And on the bottom of the t-shirt it said, but only one can save. Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ who went to a cross for us 
and died for our sins so that we can have life now and life forever. We can never repay. But yet then he told his disciples to do what? Pick up your cross. Pick up your cross and follow. And, I, and sometimes as, as Christians, I don't know where we ever, you know the one thing, this whole gospel of prosperity. You know what the gospel of prosperity is? If you believe in Jesus, you are going to have good health and amazing wealth, right? And if you don't believe it, just send me a check every week and I guarantee it's going to happen. <laughs> ah, the TV evangelist that the gospel of prosperity. Uh-uh. But I'll tell you what, are any of you hurting out there today? Our Lord and Savior knows what it is like to suffer and to be persecuted and to hurt. And our Lord and Savior meets us in the midst of that. That's the amazing thing we have with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In the midst of our hurt, our Lord is there to bring comfort and say, I love you. I came into this world for love, to show you just how much God loves you, that I was willing, I was willing to go to the cross. Lord, thank you for that amazing gift and help us each and every day to carry our crosses. Certainly, maybe not ever, we can't make the difference that you did, but in our own little ways, in our own little ways, help us to make a difference in this world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
may remain seated and let us confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and a life everlasting. Amen. For our prayers this morning, we'll begin by singing our prayer song, Lord, listen to your children praying. I will offer prayers and open it to all who have gathered to lift your prayers, either silently or loud. And then we will close by once again singing our prayer song. Good and gracious Lord, we are made children and heirs of God's promise, and we pray for the church, the world, and all in need. We pray for the church and its ministry. Bless the newly baptized and encourage them in their journey of faith. Sustain all members of the body of Christ in lives of prayer, service, and worship. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for natural wonders of your creation. Restore damaged forest, waterways, and natural habitats, and lead us to good, be good stewards of what you have provided. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those in authority. Give them wise minds and compassionate hearts. Strengthen in them a desire to protect the vulnerable and to care for those under-deserved. Lord, in your mercy, we pray for those who are struggling with cancer, dementia, and other diseases. Provide them with peace and resilience for the days ahead. Sustain caregivers with energy and patience. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for this congregation, for its musicians, readers, pastor, acolytes, and ushers, and all those who use their gifts to serve in this place. Bless us through their ministry and grant them the passion to continue in their service. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we give you thanks for all your saints, those who have loved and known, and those from every time and place. Continue to guide us by their example and reassure us of your promised salvation. Lord, in your mercy. And Lord, now hear the prayers of those who are gathered here this morning. Lord, yesterday we marked for 20 years of the terrible day of 911, the destruction of the 10 Twin Towers. We continue to pray for all those who are impacted and an understanding is peace as we move forward. Lord, all these things. We commend them to you, trusting in your grace and in your mercy. And it's in Jesus, the Christ, our Savior, that we pray. Amen.
for our offering. Once again, we'll have a basket behind uh, the baptismal font uh, where if you have brought an offering with you this morning, you may place it there. And we give you thanks for your gracious and generous support uh, that continues to support the ministry here at Lakeside, this community, this nation, and the world in which we live. Let us pray. God of all creation, all you have made is good, and your love endures forever. You bring forth bread from the earth and fruit from the vine. Nourish us with these gifts, that we might be for the world signs of your gracious presence. In Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Together let us pray our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us sing our sending song, Lead On, O King Eternal. Go in peace, serve the Lord.